forest in the Netherlands, the most popular outdoor attraction in the country with more than 200 million visitors a year. Until the 1970s, a large part of the forested area was managed for wood production, which resulted in monocultures. In the last decades, focus shifted towards a more integrated forest management in which ecological, production and recreational values are simultaneously achieved. This shift, together with climatic changes, may have caused the increase of one of the most dangerous animals of Europe. An animal almost invisible to the human eye. The tick. Public health organizations all over Europe are sounding the alarm. Infectious diseases due to tick bites have increased dramatically over the last years. One of the most threatening tick-borne diseases is Lyme disease, caused by the Borrelia bacterium. Annually, 25 to 30,000 people in the Netherlands get infected with Lyme disease. Due to the skill and importance of this problem, it is highly relevant to know what factors determine tick population dynamics. Ticks go through different stages during their lifetime. The larval, nymph and adult stage. The question that we can ask, in order to get more insight in tick population dynamics is, how is life stage related to host preference? Different life stages need different hosts. So larvae are generally to be found on uh, small rodents, uh, mainly mice. The adults you mostly find on large mammals, but mostly, most important is that the larvae you find on mice and the adult ticks on the larger mammals. From this explanation, it is clear that small mammals are of major importance for tick survival and reproduction. The common small mammal species in the Netherlands is the wood mouse. If tick density can be explained by wood mouse abundance, then what is a suitable habitat for a wood mouse? It's anything with uh, trees with large seeds, with seeds like uh, beech, like oak, uh, hazelnuts. Uh, things like that. Also smaller seeds they eat. Um, forest with uh, insects. They eat uh, when the, uh, they they eat tree seeds when they're available and they hide them for later use. But in the meantime, they also eat insects. Mm -hmm. They eat uh, uh, mushrooms, all kinds of so. Any habitat that contains uh, these food sources, in principle, is suitable for wood mouse. This is not really suitable for wood mouse in terms of cover. It's bare, it's open. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is very scary. This is, uh, so any, pre uh, any owl from above can, can scoop down yeah. and, and catch a mouse. So it takes a lot of courage to walk around here. Mm -hmm. And wood mice do have that courage. Yeah. Uh, they go out and collect seeds and then hide them for later use or Eat, the, eat them immediately. But the, the bankfall, which is another mouse species here, mm -hmm. it, 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 it doesn't go out there. Okay. It's too yeah. scared. Yeah. But uh, in general, structure means more mice. Literature also indicates that the presence of sufficient vegetation cover and seed producing trees are important factors that determine the abundance of small mammals in an area. Ticks can sense these animals by different mechanisms such as transmitted heat, carbon dioxide, vibration of the vegetation and by scent. To examine the relative importance of the previously introduced mechanisms, the following research question has been formulated. How is tick density in temperate forests related to the habitat suitability for small mammal hosts? Following this research question, it is hypothesized that tick densities are higher in forests that provide a suitable habitat for small mammals, since these animals are important hosts for ticks in their nymph stadium. Food availability and vegetation cover against predators are good indicators of habitat suitability for small mammals. Canopy cover and undergrowth can increase tick survival by maintaining a favorable, moist microclimate. A mechanism by which ticks locate areas of high host densities is by sensing host species. Furthermore, 
Ticks will prefer locations with a structure of vegetation over locations without the structure because of the increased chances of contact with the host. From these hypotheses, it is clear that tick density can be examined on different spatial scales. The movement patterns of ticks occur on a relatively small scale of some decimeters, whereas tick densities as a result of mouse abundance occurs on a larger scale of tens of meters. In order to find the driving mechanisms that are operating on these different spatial scales, a manipulative lab experiment and a correlative field study were performed. In the manipulative lab experiment, the mechanisms that determine tick densities on small scales will be tested, with the focus on choices that ticks make on the presence or absence of host species and the presence or absence of vegetation structure. In the correlative field study, the large-scale mechanisms will be examined, in particular the relation between local density of ticks and the habitat suitability for small mammals. The manipulative study has been used to look whether there is an effect of structure and mouse species on tick movement. This study design contains three factors. Treatment, experimental blocks and experimental rounds. The first factor, treatment, consists of four levels known as the compartments within the boxes. These compartments are no structure with mouse species, structure with mouse species, structure without mouse species and no structure and no mouse species or the control experiment. Per experimental round, the four boxes were used as a blocking factor in the analysis, as the boxes might slightly differ from each other. In total, there were four experimental rounds. This resulted in 16 replicates, that is, four blocks times four experimental rounds. The PVC tube connects the four compartments, each containing one of the four levels. Ticks were released in the center of the PVC tube. In order to simulate a natural litter layer, 3 grams of shredded broad buckler fern were added to each compartment. In the compartments with feces, 0.15 grams of fresh weight mouse feces were added. For vertical structure, 4 equal sized twigs of broad buckler ferns were added. The compartments were randomly assigned to the structure treatment. However, compartments which contain feces should always be on the same side, as feces odor from previous experiments might contaminate the boxes. The air humidity was regulated by putting equal-sized wet cotton wool inside each compartment. Before we started each experiment, the collected ticks from the correlated field study were able to acclimate to the lab conditions from 3 to 5 pm. For each experiment, 20 ticks were taken randomly and released into the boxes at 5 pm. This means that in total 80 ticks were used per experimental round. Each experimental round lasted till 9 am the day after the release so the ticks were staying in the experimental setup overnight, which is the period in which they are most active. For each experimental round, new collected ticks were being used. Based on our theoretical framework, we assume a positive relation between the number of nymphs and feces, as well as a positive relation between the number of nymphs and vertical structure. This implies that we expect more nymphs in the feces and vertically structured compartments compared to the control compartment. On top of this expectation, we expect an interaction effect between the presence of feces and the presence of vertical structure. This compartment implies the presence of a host and the presence of cover for hosts, which were two essential features of our conceptual framework. Consequently, we expect the highest number of nymphs in the structure plus feces compartment. The counted number of ticks will be introduced in the model as the dependent factor. The fixed factor consists of the different treatments, which contain four levels that refer to the different compartments. Control, only structure, only feces and feces plus structure. As mentioned before, the experiment contains four experimental setups, which are used as a blocking factor in the analysis. The four different experimental rounds are also included as a blocking factor. By including this blocking factor, Variation due to the different experimental setups and rounds can be accounted for. The fixed factor and the blocking factors are all nominal data. The number of ticks, however, contains count data. This implies a Poisson distribution, so the analysis will be carried out under a Poisson distribution. The results show that no significant differences between the experimental rounds and blocks were found. There is no evidence that the number of nymphs was significantly higher in the host species compartments, 
which implies that our prediction regarding this compartment needs to be rejected. The second prediction, focusing on the relation between nymphs and structure, is partly right. For the compartments with feces, the compartment with structure contains a significantly higher mean number of nymphs when compared to the compartment with only feces. For the compartments without feces, this was not found. There is no significant difference between the control and the compartment with structure. The third prediction regarding the interaction effect cannot be confirmed. The results do not show a significant interaction between the presence of host via mouse feces and the presence of vertical structure. In order to analyze the power of our analysis, we had to come up with an alternative method, since we were working with a Poisson distribution. The approach we used was plotting the different sample sizes against the possible p-values. The graph shows that for a sample size of 16, the p-value is lower than 0.05, and thus this is the smallest sample size at which a significant effect might still be measured. The correlative study is designed to examine the part of the hypothesis focusing on firstly the relation between the number of ticks and habitats providing food for hosts and secondly the vegetation cover in relation to the number of ticks. To do so, three types of food availability habitats were determined. A high food availability habitat, an intermediate and a low food availability habitat. In the research we did not measure food availability directly because of practical reasons. Instead. The main tree species of each stand is used as an indicator for food availability. Based on literature, Vagus sylvatica and Quercus robur stands are classified as high food providing habitats for mice, Pinus sylvestris and Pinus nigra as intermediate habitats, Pseudotsucha menciesi and Larix conferi stands are classified as low food providing habitats. The correlative study is carried out in the Oosterang forest. Based on the stand map of the Oosterang forest, the different food availability habitat types are identified. From the identified stands, a random sample of 60 stands was taken. So for each of the three food availability habitat types, 20 stands were taken. The sample stands were at least 200 meters apart from each other to ensure independency. Within each stand, the number of ticks were collected on a randomly chosen transect of 25 meters. Ticks were collected with a 1 meter wide cloth sheet dragged on a steady pace over the vegetation. Together with collecting ticks, other variables were measured. Firstly, undergrowth vegetation cover was measured to be able to examine the relation between cover and tick abundance. Vegetation cover was measured each 5 meters of the transect for 3 strata. These 3 strata were 0 to 15 cm, 15 to 50 cm and 50 to 150 cm. This was done to account for cover occurring at different heights. The cover for each stratum was average for every transect. Canopy cover was measured on 0, 5, 10, 15 and 20 meters using a circular tube. At the very same points, vegetation height was measured in centimeters. Both canopy cover and vegetation height were averaged for each transect. Lastly, the dominant undergrowth species was determined. The whole procedure resulted in a number of ticks, an average vegetation cover per stratum, an average canopy cover, an average height and the dominant undergrowth species per sampled stand. The standard deviations for the averaged variables like canopy cover and undergrowth height were used as a variable indicating the heterogeneity since it provides information on the variation within each averaged variable. The rationale used within our conceptual model leads to the prediction that the number of nymphs will be significantly higher in habitats containing food providing trees for small mammal hosts. To analyze the relation between the number of counted nymphs and the food potential habitat for small mammals, a generalized linear model is used. In this model, the counted number of nymphs is the dependent vector. Host food potential habitat type will be the nominal fixed vector, containing three levels, high, intermediate and low. To account for the additional variation, covariables will be used. Since we expect the relation between the undergrowth vegetation cover and undergrowth vegetation height, these are included as covariables. Canopy cover will be included since literature highlighted the importance of microclimate for ticks. Covariables are all continuous variables. The model will be run using a backward selection method, in which all non-significant variables are excluded. Due to the fact that the number of nymphs consists of count data, 
the model needed to be run using a Poisson distribution. It appeared that the high food potential habitat and the intermediate food potential habitat significantly differed from the low food potential habitat. All co-variables turned out to be non-significant. The final model therefore consisted of only the habitat type. The prediction that high potential food habitats for mice would be the class containing the most nymphs is therefore not met. However, the low food availability class contained significantly less nymphs. Furthermore, we assume a linear relation between the undergrowth vegetation cover and the number of nymphs, as well as between undergrowth vegetation height and the number of nymphs. These relations will differ for the different food potential habitats, resulting in higher intercepts for the better food potential habitats. Again, a generalized linear model is used to analyze this prediction. The independent variables, cover and height, are included as covariables. The explaining variables are singly entered into the model. The variable accumulated undergrowth was added to describe the cover over all three layers and consists of the sum of these layers. The scatter plot represents in all cases the number of nymphs on the y-axis and the independent variables, different covers, height, on the x-axis. When analyzing the graphs, it becomes clear that all variables show weak relations with the number of nymphs, which is reflected in the low r-squared values. Furthermore, it is interesting that most relations are negative which implies a decrease in the number of nymphs with an increase in value of cover or height. No significant relation was found for cover and height. Apparently, undergrowth vegetation cover and undergrowth height are weak explanatory variables for nymph abundance. An essential unanswered question within our research remains about the causal mechanism that can explain the significant difference between high and intermediate food potential habitats and low food potential habitats. In order to examine this question, on the basis of our dataset, a canonical redundancy analysis or RDA was carried out. In this analysis, the gradients within tick abundance, this means the abundance of adults, nymphs and larvae, are examined for the different plots. The undergrowth covers, undergrowth height and canopy cover are used as an explanatory environmental gradient. Furthermore, dominant undergrowth species and stand species are used as nominal environmental gradient variables. This generated a species environmental canonical analysis. The number of ticks were log transformed in order to reduce the large variation. Here you can see the ordination diagram that is displayed as a result of the canonical RDA analysis. The axes represent the length of the gradients as calculated by the canonical analysis. The plots are represented as the different dots. Plots with an A refer to the high food potential habitats, B to the intermediate and C to the plots with the lowest food potential habitats. Plots for the different food potential habitats are not very strongly clustered. However, some patterns can be observed. More importantly, there seems to appear no strong explanatory gradient of undergrowth species, cover, height, canopy cover or stand type. In the statistical output, it becomes clear that the explained fraction remains relatively low, since only 0.22 is explained by our measured gradients. From these results, we cannot conclude what the causal mechanisms are that drive tick distribution. To interpret this outcome, it remains important to bear in mind on which scale host-tick interactions take place. To illustrate how tick distribution changes over scales, besides the scales covered in the manipulative and correlative study, we zoomed out to an even larger scale, in which we showed tick abundance over the whole sampled area. Using ordinary Kriegen analysis in ArcGIS, a gradient in tick abundance appears. When analyzing this gradient more thoroughly by looking at the semi-variogram, a significant spatial autocorrelation seems not apparent. A more and eye test confirmed this. Even though this larger gradient was not significantly proven, it highlighted another important scale-dependent mechanism. When changing scales, life stage of ticks becomes important. Female adult ticks are of major importance for tick distribution, since they reproduce and therefore determine the spatial distribution of larvae. Adult ticks host on species which have a large distribution potential. This implies that tick distribution is a consequence of host dispersal, rather than actively searching for suitable host habitats. Larvae and nymphs are bounded to small spatial scales. Their distribution is therefore highly dependent on where adult females lay their eggs. When taking this ecological consideration into account, the assumed causal mechanisms in this research that is, ticks having a preference for habitats suitable for small mammals, are not sufficient in explaining tick densities. 
Of course, other aspects play a role as well. An important one is the sampling of ticks with the dragging method. Although it's the only convenient method, dragging the cloth over vegetation can hamper the collection of ticks, which results in additional variation. Through this research, the complex host-tick interactions became visible, and the spatial skills on which ticks make choices regarding their hosts, habitats and ultimately their survival are a good starting point for future research in explaining the causal mechanisms underpinning tick distribution. This could therefore be a major step forward in assessing risks for Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. Mm -hmm.